Well, well welcome again. Uh, glad to have you at Sanctuary this morning. For those that are you in this place and those of the, you that are gathering online, hey, good morning. Everybody here, say good morning to the people online. Good morning, good morning people online. <laughs> and welcome to the family. <laughs> you're very much a part of this family, even though you're not in this room, and so we welcome you. I, I received another testimony this week. I should share it with you. Did anybody see the testimony? Hallelujah. I am going to try to find it. I should have looked it up before. Bless you, dear. I gotta go to my own page. Amen. So, it's been a little while since we received one of these, and I'm just so grateful that we got a new one. So, um, Pastor Tim shared this with me. Dear Pastor, it amazes me the lives that are impacted from your messages. Kendra from Detroit suffered from sexual abuse for years. She has now surrendered her life to Jesus, and the messages learned from the past have helped her stop the insanity. Oh, and she left her abusive relationship. Blessings. Hallelujah. Uh, you as the local church here, you help make that possible. So thank you. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your diligence in being here. I, I thank, once again, our, um, our supporter, whoever that might be. And I pray that uh, God is just pouring out abundant blessings upon whoever that might be because of their diligence in serving and making sure the gospel reaches to all the ends of the earth, right? Because then the end will come. That's Jesus' promise. Well, we are launching into a sermon series uh, for the book of Galatians. If you've never read it before, it's uh, just a few short chapters, but it is a powerhouse of a letter uh, that Paul had written to the churches in Galatia. And I'm just going to give you a very brief introductory. You can look at any study Bible or anything online to find out more about the book of Galatians, but I'll give you a little bit more this morning. Paul's letter to the Galatians was addressed to a group of churches in Galatia. Maybe you've heard of that. It's actually really modern-day Turkey. That's the map that I was going to show you this morning to see where Galatia actually was. In Paul's day, the word Galatia had two distinct meanings. In strict ethnic sense, Galatia was a region of Central Asia Minor inhabited by the Galatians. Would make sense, right? <laughs> they were a Celtic people who had migrated to that region from Gaul, which is modern France, in the 3rd century BC. The Romans conquered the Galatians in 189 BC, but allowed them to have some measure of independence until 25 BC, when Galatia became a Roman province incorporating some regions not inhabited by these people that had moved down. So there's the Celtic Galatian people. And then in the southern part of Galatia, there's uh, parts called Laconia and Phrygia and Pisidia. And you hear about some of these things in some of Paul's letters too. In a political sense, Galatia came to describe the entire Roman province, not merely the region inhabited by the ethnic Galatians. So Honestly, people aren't exactly sure who Paul directed the letter to, whether it was the ethnic Galatians or the people in the southern part, which is really the places where he, where he had visited the churches. So most likely it's the southern part, um, but nobody's exactly sure. The imperative to write, false teaching had crept in and begun to threaten the church. Um, so why do you think that maybe the letter to Galatians is appropriate for today? What do you think? Same. Same thing happens, right? What was true then is true now, and we have to be very, very careful. So uh, I'm going to read chapter 1 in Galatians. Excuse me for a second. I'm in the midst of my Bible reading plan. read. Somebody want to sing the, um, the Jeopardy song while I'm looking this up? <laughs> you guys might need some lessons right there. Okay, Gal <laughs> Galatians 1. <laughs> All right, beginning right in the beginning. I'm going to read the whole chapter, then we're going to pray, okay? Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. 
grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for sins, for our sins, to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. <laughs> Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my own people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. Af then after three years, say three years, three years, <laughs> I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none other of the apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith the once, that once he tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, O oh God, for this word, God, that has come forth over thousands of years, and God, that it, the truth of what it contains is truth today, God, and that we can rejoice in having these words, God. We thank you, Lord, for these things that were written down, that we can hold fast to them today and understand them in our hearts today. So, God, I pray, Lord, that this word would take root in our hearts this morning and bear fruit, fruit of righteousness for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, uh, had said that the, the, the book of Galatians was his favorite epistle. He said, this is my epistle. I am wedded to it. It was on the masthead of the Reformation. It has been called the Magna Carta of the early church. It is the manifesto of Christian liberty, the impregnable citadel, a verifiable Gibraltar against any attack on the heart of the gospel. As someone had put it, immortal victory is set upon its brow. That's a lot of kudos for one simple letter of just a few short chapters in such a large book, amen? But Galatians has such a foundational message for us as Christians today and in all days. Why? Because it's the most powerful New Testament defense of the basic nature of the gospel. The message that forgiveness Freedom and spiritual salvation are possible only because of God's gracious gift through the life and death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. A gift that is only received through faith, right? Not what we do, faith. Received through faith. And so Paul begins his letter immediately with a defense Right? This is not his typical Pauline letter. If you read some of the other things that he's written, he normally starts out with a greeting and then goes on to say, I've heard such wonderful things about you and blah, 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 all this fluff. He kind of gets right to it because he's, I think, downright annoyed that he had spent all this time investing in these churches and now they're getting a hold of something that's completely against what he had been preached to them and that he is saying, I received from Christ. And so it begins with this, this defense. He gets right to it. He says, I'm called of God, not by man. This is an important thing for Paul to say, look, I didn't receive this teaching from anybody else. This is a direct revelation from Jesus Christ himself. The truth of what I shared you came from Christ himself. You should not be adding to it from anybody else, but that God himself reveal it to us. 
And so his call is from God. Your call, when God calls you, and this is not necessarily a ministry call, although all of us have the ministry of reconciliation, amen, that's another thing that's in the, the Bible, right? We're called to this ministry, this, this personal walk. We need to know that God called us. We need to know that it's not man that's saying that we need to do, the, do these things, right? You're not responding to God's call because of anything that I say. I'm not the influencer, right? It's the Holy Spirit that God calls us. Why? Because you might come up against things. We need to know who has called our name, amen? It's not me. It's not anybody else in human form but God himself that calls and gives the gifts and pours out his spirit. That's to whom you respond and who you answer to. So he takes only a few short lines to greet the brothers and sisters in Galatia, but in this he shares what's probably really an early confession of faith, a reminder of what the true gospel is. And it goes like this, right in the beginning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Those short lines are the gospel. It's right there. And so these things are what the early church had to hold on to, to repeat over and over again, to understand the truth of what the gospel is. Maybe if you grew up Catholic and you experienced communion or the mass, what would they say? Christ has died. Christ is raised. Christ will come again, right? If you know these, those are uh, communion words. Those are confessions of faith. Things that the people would hold on to to understand the truth of the gospel. This is the gospel. And he has to remind them because of what comes next. He jumps in on the purpose of his letter. He says, I am astonished. <laughs> what is going on? I am astonished. Somehow yeast has gotten into the bread. There's another gospel being shared. And according to Paul, this is no gospel at all. None. Why? Well, the simple meaning of the gospel is good news. And the gospel that had worked its way and snuck its way into the Galatian churches was simply not good news. Legalism. Come on now. Say legalism. Legalism had made its way back in after they had tasted the true freedom of Christ, that salvation by faith. There's a term that they use. He says the Judaizers. I can't even almost say it. I, I was reading my, uh, actually Libby looked over my notes and she goes, what is that? <laughs> and they're basically people that were trying to come in and, and suggest that they needed to go back to following the law of Moses in order to first come to faith. You need to be a Jew first and then. And so for what that meant, for the men, this meant surgery again, Okay. <laughs> So they're sneaking in there saying, you first have to be circumcised, men. You have to begin this process before you can even come to faith in Christ. And it was more than that. It was about observing the Jewish holy days and special days and all these other celebrations that really meant nothing to their salvation. So they were trying to incorporate all of this bondage on top of them. Even Jesus spoke to this before. He says, you, you pile up all these things on people's shoulders and you're not willing to help them carry it themselves. And Paul had even said, I, I, I lived to defend the faith of my fathers, right? It's the traditions of men, these things that pile on, that get in the way of true freedom in Christ, a true understanding of who he is. Back in, um, a couple years ago, we had done the screw tape letters. And we did a performance of the screw tape. And if you remember that story at all, if you've ever read the screw tape letters, basically it's from the perspective of a, a senior devil in understanding how to get uh, somebody that's not quite a Christian to fall away from the faith. And basically he talks about all these kind of subtle ways that you can get a hold of somebody. Even the church was one of those things. Oh, get them to church because then they'll think they're okay, even though they might not be understanding true faith in Christ. It says in the scripture that the devil appears as an angel of light. The devil appears as an angel of light. And sometimes, just like this gospel had come in and confused people and looked like the right thing and the true thing, the devil's good at messing things up that way and, and bringing extra things in and, and making us believe that we have to do certain things in order to come to faith in Christ. 
even Paul writes in this, he goes, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. See, even the devil appears as an angel of light. Now, Martin Luther, I talked about who loved the book of Galatians, wrote a whole treatise. Now, there's only a, a few short chapters, and I think he wrote like 700 pages on the, the book of Galatians. But this is one short passage that he wrote. I'm going to read it to you. He says this, When the devil sees that he cannot hurt the cause of the gospel by destructive methods, he does it under the guise of correcting and advancing the cause of the gospel. He would like best of all to persecute us with fire and sword. But this method has availed him little because through the blood of martyrs, the church has been watered. Right? We talked about that when we talked about big church. How Stephen and what happened in the stoning of Stephen, instead of killing the church, it grew the church. Persecution has a way of growing the church as we defend our faith. So he goes on to write this. Unable to prevail by force, he engages wicked and ungodly teachers who at first make common cause with us, right? Align ourselves, seem like we're on the same page, then claim that they are particularly called to teach the hidden mysteries of the scriptures, to superimpose upon the first principles of Christian doctrine that we teach. This sort of thing brings the gospel into trouble. May we all cling to the word of Christ against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So you can see, like we said right in the beginning, this has always been an issue. It was in the early church, it was during the Reformation, and it continues today. John's first letter, in chapter 4, he says this, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. And may I say, and in the church. The spirit is what brings confirmation. Okay? So I could stand before you and preach something that's not the gospel. And how would you know? I'm smiling. Claim to be charismatic, maybe entertaining <laughs> but i stand before you as one has developed a relationship and taken the time to know you and gotten close to you how easy it would it be for me to begin to sow a little yeast into the leaven into the bread you would trust me wouldn't you <laughs> she was shaking her <laughs> But you need to know. You need to know your word. You need to be prayed up. You need to know that what I'm saying is truth. And if any, at any time that God brings conviction and you're saying, I don't believe that's right, I hope that you will talk to me about it and that we will engage together. I'm not perfect, right? Only God is perfect. But the only way that you would be able to discern truth from non-truth is to know it yourself. So I want to encourage you, be read up, know your word. It's easy for those that are sheep to be drawn away. There can be wolves in and among the flock. So the Spirit brings confirmation. Many strong and believable teachers out there, so you need to test and see it's from God. I'm going to include anybody that's you know, teaching evangelists and things you watch on TV and all those preachers that are out there, boy, they're entertaining, but are they of God? That's why it's so important, like I said, to pray and read your Bible. What do you have to test something against if you don't know the truth? Right? It says to test the spirits. Come on, science. You, when you do an experiment, you have the control. And then you have all these other things. You need to have something. We sang about it today. Christ is that sure foundation, the gospel of God, the Bible. This is the cornerstone. This is our control. And you need to know that everything else that comes up against it, you need to be checking it back here to the control. Does it pass muster? In verse 10, Paul speaks of his authenticity. And I love this because we just talked about this two weeks ago, right? Being authentic to what God has called you to be. 
he says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Has anybody felt like that? It'd be easier sometimes not to be a Christian, right? Just to go along to get along, amen? I thought you were going to, you had your hand up. Did you want to throw something out there, my sister? <laughs> mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. So uh, if you couldn't hear her, she was saying it's really hard because people think it's easier to be a Christian. But again, you're going against the flow. You are going against the, 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 the majority of people. And so we want to be authentic, right? If we were going to please people, we wouldn't serve Christ. It would be so much easier just to do what everybody else is doing and have friends all over the place. And that's not what we're called to be. Our goal should be to please God and him only. Amen. So the next section of the chapter is his wonderful testimony of a transformed life. Paul now, he's living in the plans and purposes of God, the ultimate plans and purposes of God, not the ones that Paul thought that he was called to. Following Christ after this radical encounter with God on the road to Damascus. And so this transformed life was radical, and everybody in that kind of region had already known who he was. He had traveled all over the place persecuting the early church and dragging people out of their homes and arresting them and bringing them before councils and traveling just to do what he thought was what God had called him to do. What he thought God called him to do. And God had to get a radical encounter with him to change the way that he thought. And sometimes that happens with us. Sometimes we're thinking we're following God. And we're doing what God has asked us to do. And yet then sometimes we need to be knocked off our horse just the way that he was. Blinded by the light. So that we can truly see God's plans and purposes. Because it's so easy unless we have that foundation. Unless we know that we're called. Unless we know that we're in his will. It's easy to fall away. And believe that we're doing the right thing and, and going after God when we're going after other gods. This, his transformed life spoke for itself. Your transformed life speaks for itself. Amen? The more that you get a hold of God, the more that that's going to preach the gospel. People knew of all of Paul's evil ways, how he sought to please men and mistakenly try to please God through persecuting the church. As he writes, he says, I was zealous for the traditions of my fathers. His reputation preceded him. And maybe yours precedes you. See, his reputation was negative, And maybe yours is too. But that's not the end of the story. In recovery, we taught a concept of living amends. As you, as we, <laughs> live out this life of faith, we can make amends for the sins of our past. Paul certainly made amends for the sins of his past, amen? He dramatically changed the course of history through his radical encounter with Christ. We can dramatically change the course of history in our families, in our communities, in our jobs, in our schools, by encountering Christ in this kind of radically transforming way. It only, remember that old campfire song? It only takes a spark to keep a fire. Okay, so you are your own spark, all right? <laughs> and we have to be careful to keep that lit. Because that little light, think about it. Um, okay, I was thinking of Frosty the Snowman. I don't know why. But you know, like when... Um, uh, Frosty's going to, um, no, little, the little girl is going to get too, too cold and they want to light a fire. And you have this view of way up on the hill and it's really, really dark and there's this tiny little fire. And you're drawn to know what's uh, this tiny little fire. Any kind of scene that involves darkness and a tiny little fire, what do you notice? The fire or the darkness? The light, right? So your spark, your fire is going to influence the dark more than you know. Living amends. 
This is forgiveness through Christ, that freedom in Christ, which is the true gospel of Christ. There is no other gospel. And maybe you've never really heard that before. Maybe you thought it was all about obeying rules and being a good person. You know, that's the traditions of men, the faith of our fathers, those things that we have to do. You have to do A, B, C, and D, and somehow that makes you a good person. Well, Paul was great at obeying the rules and knowing the law, and yet he needed that encounter with God to get a hold of what the truth really was, that faith in Christ. We're saved by faith. And sometimes that's what we need, this radical encounter with God, with the Holy Spirit to get a hold of the truth. And as Jesus promised, right, the truth shall set you free. Freedom. Freedom. True freedom. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I just come before you, Lord, knowing that the truth of this word today, God, is freedom in Christ and that there is no other gospel. And Lord, we have come from so many different backgrounds in this place and even those watching online, God, those people that are in the sound of my voice, that Lord, there are so many backgrounds that they have come from, God. And sometimes we have come from backgrounds that that focus on works and not on faith. And so, God, if there are those now today, Lord, that have gotten uh, beaten down by having to perform, by having to uh, accomplish a certain amount of um, tasks to be done and, and, and certain amount of prayers and certain amount of church services to attend and a certain amount of things and just ways to pray and all the things that you have to do to be acceptable by God, I pray, Lord, that they're able to get a hold of the truth of this gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is freedom in Christ, that there is salvation through faith and faith alone, that not by works, so that we don't have to boast, that it doesn't make us better than anybody else, but that, God, you are supreme and that you you love us, God, abundantly, God, and that you have called in each and every one. And so the great equalizer, God, is just that faith in Christ, not what we've done, not what we can do, but that, God, you've called us to faith first. And so, God, I also pray for those that might be struggling with this faith, that, that might have a, 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 a struggle in believing the truth of this gospel. Can it really be that easy? <laughs> Sometimes, God, we struggle with thinking that it has to be harder. Somehow it has to be harder. That truly this gift of salvation, it's free through faith. It's that simple. And for those that struggle to know that God loves them so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God, I pray, Lord, that any any roadblocks, any stumbling blocks to coming to an understanding of the truth of just that simple verse would be removed. And they would be able to own that today, knowing that the love of God... Uh, permeates everything and goes so far beyond what we could do, what we could accomplish. We couldn't possibly do anything to achieve that, God, and that's grace. And Lord, no matter what we've done in the past, it doesn't keep us from the love of God, and that's your mercy. I thank you for that, God, this morning. I pray for each and every one, God, that they would be able to hold that and own that for themselves this morning. And that, God, they would release the struggle they've had with works, with trying to do too much, with trying to doubt that they're good enough to receive your love, that, God, you've made us in your image, and in so doing, God, we are good enough. Thank you, God. So be with us today, God, as we go forward, Lord, rejoicing in the truth of this gospel, that Christ, he lived He died, he was raised, and he will come again in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed, church.